Hi, this is Will. And this is Sri. Welcome to Technium, where we talk about the edge of technologies, its implication for the future, and what we can build with it. An optimistic look at the road ahead. So Sri, how's it going? Doing well? Pretty good. How about so, you? Uh, well, things are going all right. What do we got for today? I have some old red wine that I'm supposed to finish up. This is a <laughs> Cabernet Sauvignon from 2018. I don't know anything about wine, but I, this is what I have to left over. A fine vintage. I have some Trader Joe's spiced apple cider. Oh, sweet. All right. So what are we talking about this week? The, the topic this week is local first software. Have you, have you heard about what local first software is? Kind of. It kind of sounds like how software used to be, right? It wasn't all software local first software at some point. Well, uh, yeah, it, it was, but local first software also involves the connectivity part. That, that's, that's what's new. So, so <laughs> okay. I, I guess to back it up for our listeners and viewers, uh, local first software is a vision of how, how we can architect and build our software by a research group named Ink and Switch. One of the things that they noticed was we have uh, desktop software, which is very good at handling local files and working with it. And so once you have the software in your hands, you can keep using it. And then on the other hand, you have web apps, which are very good at collaboration and like real-time sharing, that sort of thing, but you tend not to own your data. And so is there a way to make the trade-off so that you can have the best of both worlds? I see. So basically it kind of is like how I was joking in that right now there's been this huge shift for the last like 10 years, maybe 15 years towards software as a service and software in the cloud and native software and standalone software on your, on your desktop is getting rarer and rarer. And so this is kind of a swing back towards making use of this local compute while still providing this connectivity that we've all gotten used to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like we, when web apps first came out, people didn't quite, they thought it was a toy. Like it, it, in the days of Paul Graham, I guess, like people were mostly deploying software as something that you would install locally on your OS and it actually came shrink wrapped at Best Buy that you would buy off the shelf. And since then, web apps, you, you don't have to install anything, you just sign up for it, pay for it as you go. It's really easy to share and collaborate. Uh, but what we lost is control over our data. And if the service goes down, then you are out of luck. Like there's plenty of users of startups that love the product, but for whatever reason, the thing goes down and they're, it's like, ah, uh, I mean, the, I think the biggest example I can think of for that are the users of Google Reader. A lot of people were using it for RSS feed reading and Google decided to ax it and left this hole. Google Re Reader is a huge one. Uh, and a lot of people are still mourning it today. I think another one that comes to mind is Wonderlist, which was a, a, a pretty simple, but very clean to-do list app. And then Microsoft ended up buying it. And then almost as soon as they bought it, uh, they were like, we're going to shut this down. And, and now you can't even use that software. I think what hurts about these things as a, as a user of, of both of these software is that there's some connectivity, like obviously an RSS reader is connected to the web and uh, a to-do list is for the most part a collaborative uh, process, but there's nothing really inherent that I should be tied to whether some company decides that they want to run a service or not. There's a difference between a software being 
connected to the wider world and a service that is entirely reliant on a third party. And I think we've gotten to this point these days where these two ideas are conflated, but it's not necessarily the case, right? Yeah, that, that's true because it's usually the same party that, that is doing both. And so we think of them as kind of one in the same, but technically, even if a, the steward of a software goes away, like the company, I mean, in the ideal world, it gets turned over to the community of users that would be willing to maintain it. The only example I can think of is Etherpad, which is a collaborative like writing tool. And other than that, I can't really think of a lot of other examples. So, so you like users are subjected yeah. to this sort of thing. And so ideally with local first software, you can build software that exists farther than whatever the current stewards of the, the software is uh, in the future. So they, the local first software Ink and Switch outlined seven ideals of which this is one. They, they call this the long now, where it's that very idea of, you know, you, you can keep using a piece of software even if uh, nobody's around to maintain it. So like with local first software, there's the seven ideals. And just to go through them real quick, it's that there are no spinners because in web app software, the data on the server is considered the authoritative data. And so that's why you always need to make the round trip. And so you always suffer that sort of delay, but in local first software, the local data is what's considered authoritative. So you, you don't ever need to make that round trip. The response time for the software ideally is, is much, much faster. Second is that it still has the property of your work not being trapped on a single device, even though the local data is what's authoritative. Mm -hmm. And we, we can talk about how that can be achieved in, later in this podcast. And then third is uh, network is optional. So you can work offline. It, it kind of comes from, well, you know, like if, if there's a way for us to keep data local and it's accessible on different devices, then, you know, like you can bring them online or offline on the network. That's totally optional. And fourth, we want to keep that collaboration aspect that web apps have. Five is we talked about the long now, and then six is security and privacy by default mostly in that the data is on your machine and it's up to you not to give out sort of thing right and seven is you retain ultimate ownership and so the, these are kind of principles that they outlined which you can tell that they're trying to take the best of both worlds from both web apps and desktop applications so we we have a lot of different implications for the architecture that would result. And so they, they wrote a piece, I, I won't go through the different ones, but they talk, go through like local files, web apps, you know, cloud drives, Git, and various dev tools. But I, I think through it all, the two things struck me about this push for local first software. One is that much of the difficulty lies in synchronization and versioning of hmm. which it seems like a, a technology called CRDTs is a viable solution to that. And yeah. two, this sort of balance between server side and client side has been like swinging back and forth for decades, ever since the beginning of computing where people alternately like swing back and forth between like yeah. who's the authoritative. And so Th those are the, the two things that kind of jumped out at me. Yeah, it, it's interesting uh, hearing this, which side is authoritative um, in the context of local first software, because another use case that comes to mind that, that does this for other reasons is gaming, right? So when you game, your local game engine takes care of rendering and executes your input immediately. 
Otherwise, it'd be very noticeable. But increasingly, as games are almost now entirely multiplayer experiences, you have to synchronize with the, the world state. Increasingly, a lot of software development paradigms actually come from gaming. I don't think that it, you can just wholesale take however gaming does this and, and implement it uh, for all types of other software, but it's, it's kind of an interesting parallel. Yeah, and so the difference here is I don't think any games use CRDDs. It's not quite the same like even like the large MOBAs they require a centralized server to maintain the state of the world in local yeah. first software their assertion is that even though there are servers the role of the server is mostly as archival and backup your the data on your local drive is the authoritative one and if there are conflicts mm. between your different de devices or your your device and like somebody else's device that you're collaborating with, that yeah. CRDTs will be able to merge the state between that. So like if we're on a uh, to, okay. to do to do list app, I can see my to do list on different devices. If I make two different changes on my two devices, then uh, the changes in the states would, would get merged. It, it's kind of like a real-time Git, uh, real-time version control uh, effectively. And so you can see that, uh, that even with, it doesn't matter who owns the device, it's just with different people, you're able to kind of merge it without a lot of user intervention. Yeah, every multiplayer game has servers that everybody's connecting to. So in this local first model, the collaboration, the way it's happening is that you don't necessarily have this asymmetry between servers and clients. You just have peers and maybe you have a server somewhere in the mix, like you said, for archival or backing up to the cloud or, yeah. or whatever it is. So the challenge here is that now, because no one client is a source of truth you have to have all of the clients maintain their own version of the truth and then some set of rules by which all of the clients can agree upon what is the current, current state. Right. And while developers have Git, it's very much an asynchronous sort of uh, version control. And what CRTTs promise is more of that real-time versioning that you see with like Google Docs. And so hmm. different applications have built their own bespoke synchronization and versioning, but usually that's brittle and not generalizable. And so the, the innovation with CRDTs is that you can construct them in a composable way so that they're generalized synchronization algorithm for specific data structures that you, you can use across the board. Interesting. So I remember doing some reading into like collaborative text editors. And I think that at some point the state of the art was these things called operational transforms. Yeah which I don't know if it's a tech specific thing or whether that's a more general idea, but it sounds kind of like CRDTs is a general purpose way to specify how to handle like merging state yeah. and handling conflicts for any kind of data structure. Yeah, uh, I think I, I remember reading somewhere that operational transforms and CRDTs are equivalent in, in some sense, like mathematically equivalent. There, there's some equivalency there, but they, they have like different properties. What CRDTs enable is different is that uh, real-time collaboration stuff because like uh, normal users are not going to do commits on Git. That, that's just not yeah. part of the way, the, the workflow that makes sense for most people. 
I think that we've gotten used to this instantaneous collaborative interaction in all sorts of apps. So at this point, it's just table stakes. I think if local for software doesn't have collaboration, then the whole idea just won't work. Like the, the market will not take it up. One thing that I remember is that if you use applications that are kind of local first in that they, they synchronize to Google Drive or they synchronize to some shared cloud drive. One thing that happens frequently is that if you somehow like shut off your laptop while it's still synchronizing or something and you, you open it up on a different device and it saves its own copy, then sometimes it will complain that you have some sort of version conflict. And this actually happens a lot with yeah. iCloud-based apps where they say, oh, like you have two copies of this document, which one do you want to pick? Well, so, so CRDTs don't have this problem because they have um, specific constraints to how data is merged and what kind of data. And so one is that the data that you have has to be commutative. So it doesn't matter in which order that you combine them, you're going to get the same result. And then mm -hmm. also there's this sense that it's monotonically increasing so that if you know, like a, a very basic data you keep track of is like uh, a counter. And so it doesn't matter which order you add, like it, it's, it's going to be the same result. And then because it just kind of keeps going up, you have, as long as you get all the data, all the clients are going to eventually converge at the same answer. And so you, you, the only time you're going to get conflicts are semantic conflicts in which the computer can't really, really resolve like the, the meaning of something, but mm -hmm. in terms of the data, there's as long as all the clients are able to get the data from the network, that they, they all merge the same place. And so the paths in which they can take from their separate different states to the final state, it's, it's a semi-lattice. That's it in short, how, how they're able to achieve it. And so as a result, it's a synchronization that doesn't have the usual conflict resolution problems that, that you have with, with like some of these more bespoke solutions that, that you got were it. mentioning where, oh, I have two versions. You got to pick one. You can't really put them together. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I'm curious because when you were listing the, the like seven principles, it seemed like the first few were related to the user experience of speed yeah. and then there's obviously we've been talking about the collaboration aspect and the last is privacy and data autonomy right yeah of those three which do you think is the most appealing to you as a potential user of local for software yeah i was thinking about this because one of the questions i had was this they, they put out the call to action in 2019 and it's been three years and I don't get the sense that it has a lot of developer mind share as of yet, like even less than Jamstack and Jamstack is basically let's, let's uh, use serverless software. Like let's use, use serverless for our backends and we'll, we'll have, which a, by the way is right. Which is hilarious because when you say let's use serverless software, what you mean is, Let's make everything, let's highly rely on servers. Right, right. It's just not our servers. <laughs> we'll, we'll use somebody else's yes. servers. And, and so I, I think the, the local first stuff is pretty transformative, but I, I, yeah, I don't get the sense that there's a lot of developer mindshare yet. And I was wondering why that was. And to your point, like of these three, like which would be the most appealing to end users? Because that would be what motivates a developer or a company to take the pains to construct software this way because a like most frameworks do not build software this way and so you're going to have to do a lot of stuff uh, that's new yourself not only in the architectural design of your software but also in the user flows and 
the UI for the sort of thing. And so, so kind of, those are good places to go. So let's put a pin in that, but going back to your question yeah. of which part would be the most interesting, I want to say probably the speed. Like we use Descript for our transcription and editing service. And it's disappointing how slow the editor is. I mean, mm. I, I have an Apple M1, which should be more than enough. But like when I click on oh, it- Look at you, Mr. Fancy Pants right, with fancy your M1. Pants. <laughs> no, it's just to say it's not my computer, right? So the- and so when I click on a word, it just takes a little while. It just feels really sluggish. And I think there's definitely certain kinds of applications in which the snappiness really matters, especially for things that people use to think with. And so we talked about Rome Research the, the last episode, and that's an example of uh, local for software in which they have a lot of these principles they still rely on mm -hmm. a, a back-end server though don't get me wrong but they yeah. do cover some of this stuff and so the when you have a tool to think with if you're always distracted with the lag and latency of the machine that you're using then it's going to keep keep getting in your way so out of those three i think that is immediately what appeals to me the most that said the the security and privacy thing is pretty important to me as well like you're talking to a guy that jumped on firefox because they to touted <laughs> privacy i used DuckDuckGo and got made fun of by peers for years <laughs> and um, <laughs> i have i have a pie hole running in addition to U block and that sort of thing yeah so I, i'm pretty so what, what I, right right going on <laughs> and like it, the 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 downside is that whenever I have to like book travel, I never get the best deals because like they, there's no like cookies to say I looked at like some advertisement or coupons or yeah. anything like that. So yeah, so so I would say like probably that one first, and then the security second. I think like you said, the collaboration part is a given. If there's no collaboration, the the thing's dead in the water. Yeah. The general public is getting increasingly sensitive about what's being run on their devices and uh, by whom and who owns what. And you can kind of see that in this recent scandal with Apple and the, the CSAM detection on photos. People now are drawing lines in the sand, whereas previously maybe they weren't about what is the boundary between my device and the things that I control and the third party who's providing me the services on my device. And so I think that you don't even need necessarily to have this tinfoil hat mentality to be sensitive to this idea. Also, so many cloud services at this point have been shut down or have changed their fee structure or changed their functionality significantly. People who use their devices enough are aware of this phenomenon and are a little bit wary of locking in things that really matter to them to yet another subscription service from some fly-by-night startup that could shut down. Maybe like a lawyer or your local accountant or or whoever, they might be wary about where they store their files and their notes and, and, and things like that to run their business. Yeah, maybe because uh, well, even back when we met in what 2011, there wasn't this class of non, like uh, prosumers effectively, prosumers <laughs> of the internet. But now I think we can say yep. that there's like a class of like people that aren't developers that are quite tech savvy, right? And so, hopefully, yep. but, but I guess, the real litmus test of this is whether given two equivalent services that solve their problems, is this the thing that affects their buying decision? Going back to that first principle about responsiveness, there's this huge wave now of prosumer tools 
uh, one that comes to mind is, have you heard of this email app called Superhuman? Yeah, yeah, I have. Yeah, so so the whole the whole premise of Superhuman is that Gmail is slow and and completely unusable, and yeah, so and, they've every made every time Paul Bukite is in a room, people tell him about how <laughs> slow Gmail is. He's like, I haven't touched right. that in like decades. Yeah. Like, why are you telling me? <laughs> yeah, he's he's not been at Google since like two thousand six or something. Yeah, 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 but yeah. yeah, so basically. Prosumers are are frustrated with these tools. And I think the the target market for superhuman is not even like software developers. Most software developers and, and other techies don't really use email that much, yeah. or they don't their livelihoods don't depend on email. But it's people like recruiters and uh, and I don't know, executives. Found, founders, who, yeah. Rely yeah, on founders and, yeah, who rely on email. And so you know, the, the, the whole premise of, of superhuman is that it's, it's super responsive. It's a very expensive monthly subscription app. But for that class of people, the, the cost is a small cost relative to the productivity gains. Yeah. So I guess that's a segue into like what sort of what sort of apps would really be able to take advantage of the properties that a uh, local first software would provide? Like where, where is there in, like, what's the killer app and like, oh. wh- what's the motivating thing. And so before we were talking about the, 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 it has to affect users buying decision. And then, so in relation to what kind of app. And so thinking about this, I think one one area would be apps in which the data is personal to you and yet you want to use it on multiple devices. So I would think that uh, time tracking software would be one of because rescue time is a time tracking software in which you're still sending stuff over to a centralized server so that you can make pretty graphs. And then alternatively, I've been using one called observe it's like observe with a q uh, i don't know why they put that <laughs> okay. name. but it's it's a completely local only thing like you can't really have a team around it and so having something that's in between in which you can share that stuff even though the data is is local to you might be an area that would be an in Another would be password managers. Like one password yeah. recently started a subscription uh, yeah. for their service. And I, I understand why, because yeah, like that's the other thing I was thinking, like maybe this local first stuff won't catch on because their revenue model just sucks compared yeah. to web apps where you can charge because it's a service. Like people are more, inclined to pay a monthly or an annual fee for it right and so mm-hmm. i don't know maybe there's there's a way around that like what do, what do you think from the consumer side i think that i see a lot of app store reviews when i'm going to download a new app where the app store reviews are this is a great app it does everything i want but it's yet another damn subscription that like wants twenty dollars a month from me, and there's like no way that I can justify this. And so I think there's a bit of fatigue happening, especially from heavy users of premium software. It's like the same idea where like if you rent furniture, like imagine if you like rent all. I mean, like what is it? Rent a center? They like rent out furniture yeah. and TV and stuff like that. It's kind of like that. And so in some. Yeah. In some cases, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense for everything all the time. Like you own nothing, and, and so so like you you just kind of keep paying an ongoing fee. Uh, I remember eight, yeah. uh, like reading a story where like somebody's grandmother was still paying for a landline, and they were renting out the phone. I think and just getting charged <laughs> for it. Uh, anyway, oh so 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 to bring it back, but the the th- thing that you brought up makes sense from the perspective of the user, but for the yep. people making the software, it's so tempting to say, uh, you know, me like 
my thing is essential. So like, I'm going to do a subscription because at least there's that lifetime value, like the, the total amount that I would get per customer would be larger than anybody would be willing to pay all at once. And so yeah. if I smear it over months, if not years, then I would get customers that I wouldn't otherwise get. And um, like, there's no way that this sort of software would be sustainable if everybody just paid a one-time fee. And so it, mm -hmm. from the perspective of people building it, then uh, it, unless there's some reason that you, you can think of to justify going local for software, I have a feeling everybody's gonna want that subscription model because yeah once you can get it going it, it works pretty well like margins are huge of course i think you'd prefer as a developer that type of recurring revenue but one thing that i've seen especially in the the premium software segment like productivity software mm -hmm. is a lot of apps are being released in this in this kind of lump sum model where you pay for a current version and you get, you know, one year's worth of updates and patches and improvements. Mm. And then if you, if you don't want any improvements beyond that, then like, that's fine. Right. That's the, that you, you paid for that one year. Yeah, um, so but you, if you, you have can't want fork, that, you... right. It's effectively forking yeah. or like, yeah, like you can keep on using it, but you won't get any new, new updates. Yeah. And then if you, if you want though, you can, you can catch up and you can, and so it's not, it's, it's slightly different from this versioning model because mm. you used to buy like, you know, version like a windows 95 and 2000, or you'd buy like QuickBooks, like one uh, version of QuickBooks every year. Uh, and so this one is still kind of this continuously improving single piece of software. It's just that you stop getting updates it stops auto updating basically after some amount of time, uh, but you can still keep using this, uh, this, this software. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then, then yeah, maybe, maybe there's, there is a way around that because then you could justify either a higher initial price or, or just you, you pay over time or as long as you want upgrades, then you keep paying. But if you don't, then we can part our ways and you just keep using the old software as is. Yeah. I think one thing that I saw that was interesting um, is that on Ink and Switch's research, because they're, they've laid out this manifesto of local first software. And then yeah, that, that was the as a was research lab, <laughs> A manifesto. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a great manifesto. And I think everyone should, should give it a read. But of course, they have more targeted research projects that are in furtherance of, of these ideals. And one thing that I think they, they are incubating is this, this project called Cambria, mm -hmm. which is basically a solution to how do you version your local first software API, basically. So if yeah. you have everybody running, running different versions, you can imagine that you want to update your data model or improve your data model, and you want to have all these clients continue to interact. And so how do you version it and how do you reconcile, you know, data coming from different versions. So your one client is on version X and the other one is on slightly incompatible version of the same data structure. How do you reconcile it? And so I think that's an interesting research project because it could help alleviate this need for all users of a software to move completely in lockstep. If it's yeah. possible to divorce like what version of software you're on from like what collaboration API you're using, it's possible that you could stop subscribing 
and you, you, you still have your perfectly working software, but you don't necessarily have to be booted out of the network and prevent it from working and collaborating with people who are using the newer version of the software. Right. And so on one hand, I guess it's, it's good because then you get to retain users but, uh, for part of the community. But on the other hand, yeah. you might have like dozens of, of versions to support. Like, I, is it Android, Android developers that, yeah. that have to like support a lot of like really old devices that that their their software is running on so oh yeah guess, like device fragmentation yeah right yeah and, and, and so you you might get the same sort of thing especially like if it's it's if it's long lived but hopefully something like i haven't looked deeply into Cambria yet but like that's definitely something that is an engineering challenge like we mentioned earlier that because it's a new way to architect things there's new problems that'll come up that hopefully somebody has found a solution for already or else you're going to spend a lot of cycles trying to figure out how to do it because yeah i was going to mention that in event sourcing like mm -hmm. in architecture for back ends where each piece of the software system like some microservice is emitting events and you just have like throw the events on like Kafka bus and people reading stuff from it. That sounds good in, in theory, but in practice, when you have different clients and different versions that you push out, not only a different version of the code, but also a different version of the data, then it could be a real pain in the ass to try to make sure the thing works. So either you have code in the application that have conditional statements for like, if the data is from last year, we treat it this way. If the data is from this year, we treat it this way. Yeah. Or there's some way to like go back and retroactively update all the different data with the new schema. I like it's, yeah. it's, it's a giant pain in the ass, the, the current way things are going. So hopefully Cambria, like, I, I, did you look into it a lot? Like hopefully they are able to address some of these kinds of issues. Yeah, I, I looked into it a little bit. I didn't, I can't claim that I like really know what is the mechanism by which they're trying to solve this problem, or even necessarily if they've identified the particular mechanism or whether it's ongoing research. But I, I know that this is this is the sort of problem statement, which is you know what happens if you want to update your data schema and you have all these copies, you know, or clients who are running on the old schema and then how do you sort of migrate migrate everyone out of that i think one one other thing cuz i think you're bringing up a good point about what is the economic incentive for somebody who's comfortably pulling in a passive income as a saas creator now like they've just created all these troubles for themselves with the uh, distributed, distributed yeah, systems distributed and, system. you know, like, why, like to what end? But I think, I think the incentives are not there to make your, your favorite to-do list app into a giant distributed system. But increasingly, oh gosh, now I just sound like a crazy conspiracy theorist because I've been oh, saying- Let's hear this, it. This, okay, cryptocurrency. Oh, um, right, okay. <laughs> I thought I was <laughs> bullish on it, but apparently, yeah. I so I, I I always tell everybody anytime anybody comes to me like and tells me that they have a crypto startup that they want me to work for, I'm like I don't know anything about cryptocurrency. I I, I don't this I don't know anything about this. That you mentioned this twice because like <laughs> when we're talking like outside of these episodes, you almost never mention it, and like yes. I don't even know if you own any crypto like you're not one of those crypto <laughs> fanatics but here you're just like you know crypto is going to save the world no but i i'm 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 serious about that so okay nobody's going to go and take on the burden of making a distributed system but what if you already just have to deal with a distributed system right with so these are you know cryptocurrencies and and distributed apps dapps and things like this where you kind of start from this idea that you don't own the the compute, you don't own the storage, 
you almost as a creator of a, of a DAP, you don't own anything. You put your smart contracts out onto the world and they get executed and sure you can get paid or something, but you don't have control over the environment in which this contracts run or, or anything like that. And so if you're already creating a, a, a distributed system, you're already signing yourself up to work on a distributed system, then it makes sense that the clients that interact with that distributed system are almost inherently, they have to kind of be local first because you don't know who's interacting with your smart contract and by what means, right? They, maybe they're a bot that's you know interacting through some a gateway like MetaMask or whatever. Maybe they're a mobile wallet that is uh, created by somebody else. And so you have no control. So you almost have to build a, a local for software from, from the start. Yes. Uh, I guess like two, two caveats to that, because I guess one, the Ethereum network doesn't use like CRDTs at, at all, but I, I could be wrong there, but like, so one, they don't use CRDTs for the syncing. And so as a result, whatever front end client to the Ethereum network that you build, you don't have access to sync because the Ethereum node that you're using, like that thing is synced, but your front end client is still not synced and there's no mechanism yep. for you to kind of do that. So, so I guess that's, that's one where it's, it's not quite local first in the sense that like mm -hmm. it's your data that's, that's authoritative. So the second point that I was going to make that I forgot with my train of thought earlier was uh, that the data on the Ethereum node isn't a database. Like it's structured in yep. a very specific way. And so a lot of times in order to get access to some of this data, you actually need to listen for events and keep that those events that are being emitted mm. by the node in an actual database and then yeah. query it that way. So, so to be clear, you're not saying, like you're drawing an analogy with cryptocurrencies here uh, in that, I guess if we squint our brains and see into the future, I guess you could imagine that there is an already existing network of distributed systems about some sort of topic. It could be, say, like a distributed Wikipedia, like we were talking about in the last episode, where yep. you join in and by default, if the network already exists, like you joining as a local client have no choice but to be implemented as, as local first software, right? And so yeah. another alternative is say like, like Craig's, like a distributed Craigslist. Like one of the things about Craigslist is they sue the hell out of anybody that wants to build on top of them. Like they haven't mm -hmm. updated their UI and whatever in years because they're just like, we don't care about any third party, like we're not gonna provide an API, our users haven't asked for it. And so anybody that tries to build on top of them, they just sue. And so yeah. given that sort of environment, you might wish for a distributed network of listings. And so unlike Craigslist in which there's no one central entity that owns this data, everybody else can connect to it, post stuff onto it, probably maybe with rules, but then third-party providers that want to provide value on top of it, they can do so freely without permission and it's up to the market to decide who the winners are. So, so that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, so in that sense, I, I see what you're saying. So I think it, it's not quite it doesn't live up to the principles of local for software. And if you think about the principles of, of being, you know, uh, client, client state is authoritative and, uh, and all of that. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't live up to that. I think the one thing that's exciting about 
this idea of, of having dApps is that you, you break this coupling of the client and the service. So oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I see the analogy now because like yeah. the same way we we're talking about earlier where we conflate the maintenance of the server with like the, the running of the service, like mm -hmm. it, in any dApps on the Ethereum network, like those two are actually separated out. And so yeah. once deployed, it's always going to be running. And so hence it, like all the clients don't really have a choice, but, but to interact with it as if with the assumption that it's always going to be up. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and from the perspective of somebody who's writing the service, you almost have no choice, but to design the service in such a way that you can't expect that you control the experience end to end, right? You, you anybody's mobile wallet, as long as it does the right things and sends the right commands, is a valid client of yours. You can't say, I am not going to service, you know, this mobile wallet and you have to use my front end in order to do it. Like as long as you can submit, you know, transactions, you have to service them. And so is that true? Yes. I mean, you, you can have a whitelist and blacklist of wallets, but you can't you can't stop anybody from querying like reading reading the smart contract like the the actual bytecode for the smart contracts is readily available for anybody to look at e even yeah like the, the the entire state is is queryable yeah exactly so i think like you know in that world all right so so i see your point that it's it, it doesn't take us all the way to local for software but if we get to this point where people are are working with this model that hey, I'm going to put a service yeah. up and I can't control everything that happens end to end, then uh, the one that, that sort of shifts the, the incentives so that you're more open to yeah. alternative you know, clients or, or clients running older versions or things like that. Yeah, so, so then I would say that like what, what I thought you were saying earlier still makes sense in that maybe instead of like being on the Ethereum network, you have a network of Craigslist postings or Wikipedia or whatever. Yeah. Like, so like you tap into that network with any compatible client for that data. And so if that thing already exists in an actual cloud, not just like it's, it's on the, like somebody else's server, it's in a distributed network of clients, then mm -hmm people don't have a choice but to have local first because that's where the data is yeah but then yeah that's i kind think of, that that's kind of like a chicken and the egg problem then because like you need to have enough clients with that shared data mm. for, for other people to join and so like it, that has to be bootstrapped somehow right with craigslist i think you would definitely you just have network effects there you have these different like stateful networks that you plug into, which are using this underlying layer of CRDTs, let's say, mm -hmm. to, to synchronize some state. And that state is sort of application specific, right? So one network is going to be using CRDTs where CRDTs are representing the Craigslist postings or whatever. Yeah, like, the, uh, the CRTDs are used to sync the Craigslist po posting state. And the state yes. is on every client and maybe there's an archival server that you seed from something yeah. like, like kind of like how BitTorrent works, I guess. Right. Yeah. You it's it, a, Right. So you seed it and you have some way to discover like the other clients and things yeah, yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, another project that comes to mind is, uh, is the, the DAT protocol. Mm. I, I've been meaning to look into it. I haven't looked into it. Yeah. Yet. Maybe we can do a different episode on those guys. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's kind of getting into this like decentralized web and, and things like that. But yeah, I mean, I can imagine that you know, there are these projects that where basically they're trying to figure out how do you have this 
peer-to-peer syncing and discovery of structured data. Yeah, because then like that data is effectively a public good instead of like, so, so like the internet, like the low level layers is more of a public good, but then everything else that we built on top of it has been like a private thing, even though some of it, like now that it's been around for a while, like it kind of feels like it. And so for things like Craigslist or like, th- especially marketplaces, it feels like, you know, like it should be divorced from the company, but like we accept it because there's network effects and kind of a sense that, hey, if they built it out, then maybe they deserve the, the, you know, profits and revenue going forward. But right. yeah, but for something like, like, like you can imagine like for some piece of, I guess public data, like it, it would be nice if we can make that a thing that exists and then we can keep building on top of it permissionlessly instead of having a gatekeeper like Craigslist, like right. suing people that are trying to build on top of it. Yeah. I like your angle though, of like, what's the incentive structure? Because at the end of the day, a distributed Craigslist needs to define a schema by which these posts are represented, yeah. right? Otherwise, all the cl- it's just going to be chaos. I, I don't know how we're going to transition people, especially all the SaaS people, to building in this new model. But assuming that we can get to this model, it's going to be a really weird kind of software development, right? Because, like, let's say you have a network of by which clients can discover, you know, other clients that are talking about the Craigslist protocol or the uh, photo sharing protocol or or whatever then you're going to have these people who are developing the protocol and the, what they're effectively doing is they're no longer running a service. They're just sort of defining a data model, right? Like they're defining what like the data structures are and the kind of the tables and the relations between them. And then all of the magic is, is sort of happening in this distributed way. And so that's like a kind of weird software development model, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I can. So I guess I can imagine that schema being owned by and argued over with a DAO. So if we're just going to go yes. hard into cryptocurrencies. Yes. I was going to say that, so I'm glad you did it. And then, so I don't sound like a crazy guy. Well, the, yeah, but I, I think one of the things that people don't talk about enough for cryptocurrencies is that they have experimented a lot with governance and governance structures like other than cryptocurrencies i guess like maybe open source software and like standards body is mildly better and so i mean i'm not part of any DAOs, but they seem to experiment a lot with like different governance structures with it and so you could conceivably have a DAO where people maybe you don't need a doubt maybe you just need a standards body right why complicate things but um, no i like the DAO. no i think i think it makes sense the DAO makes sense so i guess the the DAO, because like the thing with standards bodies is usually it's populated by engineers from large companies like google and facebook who have a vested interest in that standard uh and interoperability but I guess if you believe that good ideas can come from anywhere, then you know anybody can buy in and uh, membership into a DAO and use their votes to help steer the thing in a certain direction, rather than yeah more of a democracy or a republic, rather than mm-hmm. an oligarchy as most standard bodies standard bodies are for the internet. Yeah, it's it's a very very, very extreme form of declarative programming. Because right now, if I want to build a service, I have to kind of think about how is it all going to run? Like most of the software development is, how is this all going to run mm. and keeping the servers up and, and, and doing all these optimizations to save money and increasing your profits and blah, 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 and monitoring the servers and, and all this stuff. And what if you just then didn't have to worry about all that. And you could just come up with a schema and the API and 
and then drop it onto some network and the, have the community client figure it out over time. Uh, assuming yeah. that there is like a, a way to do schema upgradability, then you could evolve over time. That's both awesome and frightening because it could get a lot of cruft over time. Yeah. But like if you've ever looked at EDI specifications, it's horribly complicated. Uh, EDI is like a specification for like, like ERP software to communicate mm. with like some ERP is what enterprise resource planning. The, the mm -hmm. pitch was, was that like, oh, we have software. They all don't talk to each other within a giant company. We should all put the data in the same place so that we can see what our business is doing. <laughs> And right. so EDI is like a data specification and that thing is pretty horribly complicated, which I imagine is because they're trying to cover a lot of different use cases from a lot of different companies and yep. Cruft builds up over time. And so, yeah, like maybe both, both of us should have looked more into Cambria to see how yeah. these, like these sort of problems, because like, if anything, right. the XML guys, like the, one of the things that they found was hard about Ontology is different for people trying to solve different problems, even if they use the same words and names for things. And so, yeah, like for, for schema stuff, like I really wonder how that's going to work out. But presumably if there is a way forward in which you can build on top of that, then software development, like you cut out half the equation where you only have to worry about, am I, when, when I write the client, is it conforming to the spec as a good citizen in the same way like BitTorrent clients have to conform to the spec? But other yeah. than that, everything else is free game and I don't have to worry about the server. It effectively just exists on the cloud, kind of in the same way that mobile developers like to use Firebase or Parse so that mm -hmm. like they don't have to think about backend servers. Right, right. Uh, but you know, I, I don't know how, I, I, I'm sure there's some servers, because even Bit, BitTorrent has like some like uh, mirror servers or yeah, something that help like the clients like uh, discover each other. And I, yeah. I imagine in this like distributed like CRDT network or whatever, you're going to have like to maintain some amount of centralized or at least federated infrastructure to help these, all these clients like find each other. But for the most part, all of this is just happening, you know, between the clients, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so one of the things that Ink and Switch brought up in their manifesto is that P2P networking is still an unsolved problem. Like NAT traversal is hard. And yeah. so that is still an issue. It's, it's a thing that needs to get worked on. But like given that, and it's, like it's, it's, it's mostly between the different clients and if need be to go through a server like so be it but it should be optional rather than than like a, a given kind of like switching back to what would local for software really be good for i was thinking that the offline aspect would be really good for a market in which the internet infrastructure is underdeveloped or spotty so like in rural areas or underdeveloped countries, it would be a much better user experience and maybe it makes more sense for, for applications there. Like that, that would be a reason why developers would choose this architecture over a more centralized solution for like typical web apps. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. One interesting anecdote that I heard is that a lot of people in in India, they have data plans, but uh, they sort of ration it out for really emergency use cases. So they mostly run on airplane mode and uh, they go to some local shop or something that has a Wi-Fi access point every morning and evening and they sync their data there, right? And so you can imagine with this local for software, that's a perfectly fine use case, right? You can queue up all your, your actions and edits and things, and then you go to your local Wi-Fi access point and everything, you know, syncs up and magically yeah. you reconcile with the world. Actually come to think of it, like if we're to be a space faring race, like this sort of thing's gotta work, right? 
Right. Because like if if we're projecting out further into the future, like people are going to Mars or like you you have like people that are in spaceships on route or whatever, like it doesn't make sense to have a centralized server. Like it only makes sense that you have like a, a partial view or like whether it's outdated or not. And like every time you come into a port or something, you synchronize the data with the, the local data. And hopefully there isn't too much of a net split, but like at the very least, you would be able to sync. That, that does point to one of the current weaknesses of CRDTs is that they have a large change history because you have no guarantee as to who the oldest client is. And so mm. you start throwing away data from like six months ago and then like a client shows up that hadn't sync in over six months, then they, yeah. they have no way to like sync. So that, that's definitely an ongoing problem. But like the, the reason why I bring up the space issue is it's easy to think of the needs of underdeveloped countries or rural areas of, of oh that's not really my problem especially we live in the first like a, a first world country but yeah. that particular use case like there's no choice in space where things are just so far apart like i think a, i really think a lot of the decentralized technologies will be useful for space faring races short of like faster than light communications or something like that, which yeah. I don't see like Star Trek ever talking about it, but like, I, I, I really think that's the case. And so it would behoove us to really figure out how that sort of stuff works here on earth so that we have apps that actually work in space rather than <laughs> things that are like, oh, like we're just out of range. So tough, tough luck. You, you just have to wait another six months, right? Because like, <laughs> right, like, right. like the, the orbits are elliptical. And so in, in some cases, Mars and Earth are closer and in some cases, they're a little bit farther. <laughs> and so, yeah, that you, you're saying we, we, can't, we can't just go on building uh, uh, huge centralized data centers yeah, on different yeah. planets and connecting them with fiber optic cables. Right. Especially if we hope to be a space fearing race. I think yeah. that's the thing that I haven't heard anybody say anywhere. And so, so I think we, we've kind of hammered home the idea that one of the ways to get people to adopt local, are going to the trouble of architecting local for software is if the data or the, the network for this kind of data, whether it's email or like Craigslist listings already exists, right? So in, if you want to get to the users, through, you have to get it through the data and hence through the network. And so yeah. uh, I guess the, the kind of going back to what are the type of apps that would really benefit from local first architecture or like wh where do you think like would be the, initial in like things that are really that would really take advantage of of the local first properties yeah i think um you know going back to the last episode like note taking software yeah, yeah, yeah. seems like a really obvious use case right for the reason that like note taking is usually personal a and you want to access it on multiple devices and then occasionally you do want to collaborate and share on it. Yeah. And, and exactly. it's a thinking tool. So you want it to be really responsive. Really responsive. Like, yeah. yeah. I'm thinking about professional tools like, for example, a lot of the world and a lot of industries run on spreadsheets. And I can imagine if my business runs on spreadsheets, I don't want to be beholden to Google Drive. Like I can use Google Sheets, maybe Google Sheets, even if it had one-to-one -one parity with uh, Excel, I still don't want to re rely on the, that service to be up and running and I can't control their, their roadmap or whatever. Wait, it's a very- a small business or as a much larger like Fortune 500? business like because currently yeah. that's what people are doing though right do you get the sense that like they do it because they're forced to and so if there was an alternative they jump ship immediately or 
I think so. I mean, I, I don't know about Fortune 500 businesses. They obviously have their own their own considerations. But if I was running a a law firm or a small accounting firm or something where I have all these like sp- uh, spreadsheets, and my main use case is that I'm you know, updating some spreadsheet or updating some model that's in a spreadsheet or some projection or something. And I want to share it with my uh, my business partner or some colleagues. It seems kind of overkill for me to have this cloud subscription to Google Workspace Mm. or whatever. And it also seems like it's a risk if I'm building this, this law firm or this accounting firm for the long haul. I would think it's a it's a kind of risk to cloudify everything if I can get the same benefits through local for software. Yeah, and it's only recently that enterprises have really gotten used to the idea of like cloud for like cloud software as being secure because for the longest time even after like regular consumers like you and me have like gotten used to cloud-based software, like enterprises are still balking. It's only recently that Salesforce has like gotten them around to things. And right. so like, I guess there's still people that are buying on-premise software that are running like instances of cloud software, right? And so maybe right. those would be good first target for stuff like that, where they want the benefits of cloud, but they don't want it running on somebody else's server. So... They want like an on-prem solution. I I hadn't thought of it from that particular angle, but definitely for like enterprises that are still using on-prem stuff, that that probably makes a lot of sense. Maybe like uh, medical records, like in in some sort of utopian world, like I get to keep all of my medical records to me and somehow there is an online like server based archival but it's encrypted and so as long as i have my private keys but i don't know as we've seen in crypto well, like people lose their private keys all the time right so well yeah i mean i think i think there has to be a good solution to that but you know definitely like i don't know about real serious health data but almost kind of internet of things type of stuff where you know, imagine we're getting to the point where you have a you have a smart watch, you have a s- smart scale. People are talking about like continuous glucose monitoring, and you have all these devices mm-hmm. around your home or on your person. And right now, the best experience that you can get is through using these hubs, whether it's you know Google Fit or Apple Health yeah. or you know, or even when it comes to like uh, smart switches and thermostats and stuff like that, like you have these hubs that, that make them interoperate, but like, could you basically have these running some type of local for software that synchronizes all of the analytics that these things are collecting into like one little dashboard? There's a subreddit called self-hosted where like people are enthusiastic about like hosting their own email service and like various other things. Like that's just not an option for most people, but uh, yeah. I can imagine that if there was an appliance that you can buy that does the archival for your own local network, then that 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 would be something that I would want to keep that data private, right? Because even though I have yeah. an Alexa, I can't say that I feel like I fully trust it. I think it's the same thing. Like I have a Roomba and it has a camera. And one Mm -hmm. of the things that I resisted for a long time was like connecting it to the central app. But when I wanted the feature of like cleaning this individual room, I'm like, ah, I gotta connect it. Yeah. We've been talking about local for software and I'm imagining like something with a user interface, but I don't see why you couldn't have these Local for, look for software, which is, is headless in that you don't have a user interface that's on a screen, but it's making use of this local first software as a kind of local first firmware where it maintains its state and it knows what it did. And it has like, let's say a floor map on, for the case of your Roomba, Roomba. it's able to function on its own, but it still has some of the nice 
syncing functionality that you get from a cloud service, except that rather than working with a cloud service, maybe it works with an appliance or, or maybe it uses your phone for compute or synchronization when it yeah. happens to be in the house. Yeah, because right now, like syncing stuff is just a pain in the ass. So everybody either writes their own, I don't know, like the bespoke, bespoke thing. Because I, I, CRDTs aren't like, and operational transforms aren't like widespread knowledge among web developers or otherwise. And so I think everybody just writes their own brittle stuff or they just don't do it, right? Or, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that that might be another way uh, forward. So then what, what would you build? Like, what would you take the p- pains to build in this type of architecture for yourself? Like what, what yeah. application? So, so for me personally, I was thinking of investment for- portfolio manager. Mm-hmm. And so that's the type of data that I would want to keep private, but I would want to be able to access it across different devices. So I use this budgeting tool called uh, YNAB. You need a budget. And it's a very nice software. It actually, in fact, used to be a desktop software. But I, I share the login to this account with, with my partner. And we both log in and we like categorize transactions and see how our finances are, are doing. Oh and yeah, so you can you can only ca- you would only have to categorize half of it. Like the tedium is spread out between two people rather than like you, yeah, Mint is terrible yeah. at that. Yeah, exactly. Like and and it's good to just to have like a shared understanding of what's going on. And yeah, 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 I yeah. think that yeah, it makes total sense that this could be a local for software because the only reason why it's in the cloud at all is one, I think they wanted recurring revenue, which seems to be a theme. But two, I think, you know, you other it, you can access it anywhere now yeah, uh, rather than just on your desktop. Yeah. Uh, but if it was locals for software, then you could just have a bunch of clients and, and they sync their transactions and they sync their money state. So given that, then would you make the transition? Is it if that thing exists, I guess it exists in actual budget. So like, is that yeah. enough for you to like make the switch? I think that. I hear hesitancy there. So <laughs> I'm not sure if like local first is compelling enough. If we're like, eh. No, I think I'm reaching the point where I'm reaching my subscription saturation. And I will pay you. I'll pay you 50 bucks. I'll pay you a hundred bucks, but just give me the damn software. Like, I don't want to t- spend my lifetime wedded to you, paying you $20 a month for the rest of my life, right? Uh, come to think of it, actual budget is like, I- I'm just giving them like free advertising. It's like four, <laughs> four bucks a month. So they're, they are still subscription. So I guess it's not. Well, okay. That's <laughs> both dichotomy where like you can't charge a subscription for local for software. Yeah. Then, yeah. That's true. I mean, you, you can have local for software, which only runs if it knows that you've paid them their monthly fee. Then like along the lines of like how you were saying, like inspiration from games, like some of the most profitable games out there are free to play games where they, they don't charge anything except for cosmetic updates. So you could conceivably have people pay one-time fees for the local for software and then if they want to skin or theme their note-taking app, then, you know, you, you pay up some money, right? And so yeah. maybe that's another way that things could work. So, so yeah, I, I guess given that we kind of run through this origin, I was, I, I was a little worried because I thought local first software is definitely something that would make a big difference if A, more people knew about it and B, people like took up the mantle, but I was worried that there wasn't the market incentive for that but it seems like after we talk through it, there's plenty of different ways to to make it viable right uh, i think that's the conclusion yeah. that we're running into and that like the specific apps that we have tend to be like w- what are the type of apps people can make they tend to be ones where the data is considered really personal 
but you want to access on multiple devices. Or the, the other one that we haven't talked as much about was that you want the responsiveness of a desktop app, say like a Photoshop or like Figma, I guess is, is another example, but you want to work on that and collaborate with other people in real time mm -hmm. for, for stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, all in all, I think that there's promise from this responsiveness, from this collaboration and potentially from alternative economic models or, or governance models of, of these services. And so I think there are reasons to be bullish. I think it will probably take some kind of shift in the market or in the sentiment of the users or in the preferences of developers for it this to really to take off. It just has to be like $1 billion yeah. company that's doing this and everybody else will jump on board, right? Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, I guess that's why we're talking about it, right? Like it, there's no obvious path for this to take over the world, yeah. but I think it's, it's exciting and interesting that at least the groundwork is being laid such that if the winds sort of change direction and they change the way that they're blowing, then the people who are investing in this in this space are going to be potentially making the the next generation of, of software. Yeah, sounds good. So with that, I guess we'll close out this episode unless you have other things to add. No, that's it. Yeah. So uh, so once again, this is Will and Shri, <laughs> and. Uh, we loved it that you could join us. And so next week we will have another episode talking about another uh, technology unevenly distributed on the edge, its implications and pontificate the road ahead. All right, cool. Sounds Talk good. to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.